What's going to happen in the international economic community? Are we really going to have major trade wars, or is this a short-term negotiating strategy? Will we get out of this bind? Will President Trump and President Xi figure out a way to uh, declare victory with some uh, sensible improvements and, and not uh, provoke a long-term trade imbalance, uh, long-term trade impasse? What will happen to the other large major parts of the world? Europe, the Mideast, non-China Asia, we say non-Japan Asia, but non-China Asia, um, China, uh, and the like. Let's take a quick look. If we look at what's going on in the global economy and the shares of world trade, we see here the United States on the right, and China here third from the bottom. And we see the tremendous projected growth here of, and growth of Chinese trade and its share of world trade now surpassing uh, Germany's, for example. If we look at our top 10 trading partners and we look um, divided into total and exports and imports, what we see is we uh, see China has emerged as a, a huge trading partner, okay, that we're, we're, we import more from China than anywhere else. Canada and Mexico, the other participants in the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is being renegotiated, and let's hope they do it successfully because it's very important to all three countries, um, are the other major trading partners. And then come Japan, and if you disaggregate Germany, Korea, the UK, et cetera, are all important but are modest. If you aggregate the whole European Union, it's about 20% of US exports. Well, the demography's not just been going on inside the United States with aging as population has grown, but in the global economy. And these pie charts are designed to reflect uh, a few years ago and projections out to 2050, and we see where the growth is likely to be area by area. Okay. So there's going to be a large growth of population outside the United States, outside China, big growth in lots of parts of the world more rapidly than the advanced economies which, whose population growth will be slowing, and in some cases like Japan uh, and Russia, uh, Russia's not quite an advanced economy, it's more like a, uh, uh, a gas tank attached to a modest economy. But the two economies are, uh, those, those economies are struggling with population declines or risk of population declines, uh, whereas the rest of the world, the Middle East and some parts of Asia are still growing rapidly. If we look at world GDP shares, we see, comparing 1980 and 2037, so uh, this is a 37-year period, so a generation and a half, let's call it, or just under, and we'll see that um, tremendous change, and the advanced economies now constitute a smaller fraction of the global economy than the three-quarters of the global economy it did back in 1980. So the rest of the world is growing more rapidly than the advanced economies have, a natural consequence of basic economic forces. You generally have the opportunity to grow more rapidly from a lower base. This shows GDP per capita in selected countries with the US on the far left, and we see we're about 30% higher than uh, Western European countries. And back here are uh, some of the important, whoops, some of the important developing economies. Here's Chile, here's China, here's Brazil. Venezuela, which is uh, one of the great tragedies of modern times, is collapsing. And it's unclear how we should actually measure this now, given the chaos and the monetary disruption in hyperinflation in Venezuela. If we look at the gross debt as a percentage of GDP, the Japanese, Greece, Italy are all way up there and potentially serious problems. The US, the gross debt in the United States 
is somewhat less than uh, just under 100%. The net debt, when we exclude debt held inside the government, the Social Security Trust Funds, for example, are, uh, is about 70, in the high 70% range, double what it was before the Great Recession. This is the old age dependency ratio. That's the formula I promised not to put up, so I apologize. I forgot I had it in the box there. In any event, what's going on is all these societies are aging, and aging rapidly. China will be older than the US in a generation, the legacy of the One China policy, for example. And if we look here at Germany, Italy, and Japan, we see this incredible rise in the old age dependency ratio. Something that's gonna be a tremendous burden for those societies privately as well as through government funding of transfer payments. This is our trade with China, exports and imports. Total, cons this is, pardon me, this is China's trade, exports and imports, not our trade with them, it's China's trade. One of the things people don't quite understand about China is that for any relatively successful developing economy, it has the lowest share of consumption to GDP in any historical episode anybody can find data on. So the original idea of the last five-year plan in China was to shift to more of a consumption um, and internal demand-driven economy rather than exports and investment-driven economy, and we'll see how that works. Their growth has been slowing, and they have a lot of debt and local government and real estate issues to resolve. Finally, my last point, are democracy and robust capitalism ultimately compatible? In the aftermath of the, well, pardon, let's, let's go back a little further. In the 1970s, it was very common when I first started as, my career it was very common for many American intellectuals to say all the political and economic systems around the world would more or less converge to somewhere to the left of where Sweden was at the time. The communists would, would, governments would round off their rough edges and we'd all become super advanced welfare states and they'd all converge to the same place. Then uh, the Cold War intensified and the Berlin Wall fell and Gorbachev did perestroika and glasnost, and lo and behold, uh, it was declared that history had ended, everybody was gonna be a liberal capitalist democracy. Well, the champagne corks were popped prematurely, quite obviously. Some, some economies have made successful transitions, the Poles, for example. Some societies who have moved more to capitalism from central planning and communism and socialism did so without a vibrant democracy. China has a state capitalist model. So it's unclear where all these systems are gonna go. And if the concern originally was um, that capitalism would lead to some problems, et cetera, there's been this lurking concern that if you have a society where a majority of people receive benefits from the government and a minority is paying taxes, that can be un unhealthy and taxes would get too high along the lines we discussed about 15 minutes ago. And if that's the case, what's likely to happen is the economy will grow slowly. If we look at what's actually happened in this inequality indexes, it turns out that almost everywhere, Brazil's a notable exception, but it had by far the highest inequality that was as currently measured, Inequality has risen within countries. We'll come back to something in a moment. The US data here exclude lots of transfer payments, for example, uh, health insurance subsidized or paid in kind rather than cash. Um, it doesn't include the fact the US has the most progressive tax system in the OECD, et cetera, okay? So the main thing here isn't the ranking of countries, but that the light blue bar is generally higher, uh, larger than the dark blue bar. But if we go around the world, the Gini index has plummeted. Global inequality has declined. How is it possible to reconcile those two things? 
Well, what's happened is, generally untold, has been one of the great success stories of modern times. If we look at the World Bank's estimates of abject poverty, living on, depending on what study you're looking at, $1.50, $2 a day, the numbers of people around the world living in that condition has plummeted, has declined by half. Tremendous, a tremendous improvement in a generation. A lot of that has happened inside China, where many people have been lifted out of ab abject poverty, perhaps 300 million, most of them now along the east and south coast of China. It's been the most rapid improvement in the human economic condition in economic history. In China's case, it comes with lots of problems, a lot of pollution, leaving even, even not worrying about carbon emissions from coal plants for the time being. Uh, off on global warming, there's a lot of localized pollution. If anybody's been in Beijing or uh, some, other, some other cities, you see just horrible pollution that is uh, uh, causing lots of health problems and the like. Okay? But anyway, tremendous improvement in the human economic condition. So interestingly enough, people are complaining about inequality. When we look globally, we just take people wherever they are, the global Gini index, global measure of inequality has declined. However, within countries, which is a salient for people in each country, might be happy to see people lifted out of poverty in China, but people in the United States or Britain or Germany or Japan are mostly interested in their own standard of living. Labor share of income has declined in almost all countries. It used to be fairly constant, but it seems to have pretty much declined in recent decades, almost all countries. That immediately tells us this cannot be the result of the policies of any one country. It's got to be something that is affecting the global economy, countries everywhere. So this can't be Obamacare or the Bush tax cuts. Whatever good or ill those did, I think the Bush tax cuts were pretty wise. I think the current ones on the corporate side were a good step forward. I'll get to that in a second. But it has to be something common to all these economies. And it's tre tremendous changes in technology and globalization and trade with the rise of China to a lesser extent India and some other developing economies. At the same time, we see that transfer payments to people as a percentage of personal income have been rising over time. The shaded areas, again, are recessions. And you can see here, in the Great Recession, transfer payments soared. They were made more liberally available to a wider swath of the population to try to cushion a humanitarian economic need. But they've only re been reduced a bit and we still have transfer payments as a huge fraction of national income. If we look at percentage of people below the poverty line, and we look at persons of all ages, we see in the roughly half century since just after the war on poverty was launched by President Johnson, we see that the total, this kind of burgundy-ish bar, has declined just a little bit despite 100 anti-poverty programs and expenditures of trillions of dollars. It's likely that the poverty rate would be higher without those programs, but they obviously have not been targeted super well. And if we look at children, that share of poverty, the poverty rate for, for children has risen. And if we look at people in prime working age, fairly stable, and the other big noticeable change has been the poverty rate for the elderly has plummeted and is now below that of the general population. This is partly Social Security and Medicare, but it's a variety of other things as well, including the, uh, something that's not recorded in this, these data, and if it were, would lower the rate even further, the development of IRA and 401k plans, which Josh mentioned, I had something to do with when I was uh, advising President Reagan. So people have more income in retirement than they used to. It doesn't mean everybody's well off. It doesn't mean there aren't some people in pretty bad shape late in life. And we ought to have a, an effective safety net. But it turns out um, that our programs seem to have been largely 
successful, even if perhaps more costly than they needed to be, in cushioning the incomes or keeping up the replacement rates of incomes for the elderly. Uh, and we may want to start thinking about where we're going to do with our resources in the future rather than have uh, more and more go to the elderly and less and less available for other pressing national needs. If we look at adjusted gross income shares, the top 1% has 20%, the top 5% has 36%, the bottom 50% has 11%. So it seems that the economy is pretty unequal. This is only cash measurement. The bottom number would be considerably higher if we included in-kind transfers like uh, Medicare and Medicaid. If we look at income tax shares, the income sh tax share, the top 1%, is double its adjusted gross income share. Adjusted gross income is the, where you start from in calculating your tax return. The bottom, the top 5% pay almost 60% of income taxes, and the bottom 50% pay very little, although obviously they have a very modest amount of income. If we look at people paying taxes and receiving benefits, and we try to take a look at who's doing what and what their incentives might be in voting for more benefits or higher taxes or lower taxes and the like. We have a, a bit over half the population is paying positive income taxes. At the end of the year, they have a positive tax liability. They may have been overheld and get a refund, but on balance, they're paying taxes to the government. The percentage of people paying one or more benefits and the percentage of people getting one or more means-tested benefits are the middle and right bars. That doesn't mean that this is the right number. It doesn't mean it's too high. That, that's a deeper question. And many people receiving benefits are also paying taxes. Many elderly people collect Social Security and pay taxes on their 401k withdrawals, for example. So people have different incentives here, and there are many people who eventually will need a transfer payment at some point. Maybe if the next deep recession, somebody, maybe unfortunately one or two of you, will need unemployment insurance. But in fact, we now have a situation, and it's one reason the political process is so polarized, where we're getting closer to a 50-50 split in who wants bigger, more expensive, government with more programs and transfers, and who feels tapped out in their taxes. <laughs>